Thanks for joining us, everybody, here on our Auburn Tigers Facebook page from AL.com. I'm Matt Scalisi. I'm joined by Kevin Skarbinski, who, uh, of course, was a longtime columnist and, and beat writer here with us at AL.com and the Birmingham News before that. Kevin uh, has, has covered a lot of great figures in this state, and there are very few that have had the kind of impact and prominence uh, in, in our state as Pat Dye, who uh, passed away today at the age of 80. So, Kevin, first of all, thank you for joining us. And if you can just to start us off, obviously, a lot of the people watching this, I think, know Pat Dye very well. They, they're familiar with him. But if you had to describe to somebody who, you know, either is not old enough to, to know much about him or remember him or, or an outsider about just how important Pat Dye is to Auburn, the community, the fan base, what would you say? He was Bear Bryant without the houndstooth hat in a nutshell. that That's what he meant to Auburn people. Uh, and I've always thought, Matt, of, of all the coaches that worked with Bryant or who played for him and went on to become successful head coaches themselves, I always thought, and though I, I never knew Coach Bryant, that was a little before my time in the business. I was in college when he passed. But I thought of all – of his protégés that Pat Dye was the most bear-like. Uh, he was his own man, but he was a quintessential, hard-nosed, old-school Southern football coach. Uh, he had incredible confidence in himself, a swagger about him. And he brought that to Auburn at a time when Auburn was a as low, perhaps psychologically, as, as a family, if you will, as, as you possibly could be because of where their football program was compared to Alabama. They were, Auburn people were made to feel like second-class citizens uh, in this state simply because Alabama had it, it had its thumb on the rivalry. You know, when Pat Dye got there, all, Alabama had won eight in a row, uh, and there looked, seemed to be no hope for Auburn to end that anytime soon, even though clearly – Coach Bryant was was nearing the end of his of his long and illustrious career, but there was there didn't seem to be a lot of hope for Auburn people. Pat Dye brought hope, and of course, one of the great there's so many great anecdotes about Pat, and one of the one of the best early ones is that when he was talking to Auburn about taking the job, and he desperately wanted that job. He may have gone after the job harder than Auburn went after him. But they asked him, how long would it take to beat Alabama? He said 60 minutes without blinking, without hesitating. And he meant it. It, it took him 120 minutes. It took him his, his second Iron Bowl until Bo went over the top and they ended that what then was a nine-year losing streak to Alabama. But uh, of all the incredible accomplishments uh, on Pat Dye's resume, the simplest and strongest and most enduring was – he allowed Auburn to look Alabama in the eye and not blink. And and speaking of that specifically, Kevin, when we talk about the Iron Bowl today, it's kind of indisputably regarded as one of the great rivalries in all of sports, certainly in college football. You know, it's it's obviously got a very long history. There have been a lot of coaches that have contributed to that legacy and that reputation of that game. But what is Pat Dye's contribution to making the Iron Bowl the, the game that we think of it as today? He, he's at the top of the list. He's as responsible as anyone for making it a great rivalry. Uh, I, I went back and checked the numbers, Matt, and since 1981, that's the year Pat Dye started as the head coach at Auburn, there have been 39 Iron Bowls. Auburn's 120, Alabama's 119. It became a rivalry. It really wasn't. It, it as as great as and as legendary a figure as Shug Jordan was, and deservedly so, he had a, he had a very poor record in, in the the Iron Bowl rivalry. It was Pat Dye and, who really made it a rivalry. You know, the fact that he first of all that maybe two of the most significant football games in this state's history, not just Auburn games and not just Iron Bowls, but two of the most significant football games in this state's history were. The 82 Iron Bowl, uh, when Bo Jackson was a freshman, went over the top. Auburn ended the nine-game losing streak to Alabama 
They tore the goalpost down at Legion Field. It was Coach Bryant's last SEC game. It was his last defeat, uh, and it, which was, by the way, as you talk about mixed emotions, you would think there would be no mixed emotions if you're the head coach who engineered that victory. I, I talked to someone earlier who was on that staff with Pat Dye, who walked to midfield with him after that game and said that was as difficult a walk to midfield as he's ever witnessed for a head coach after a victory. Pat Dye was like a son to Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant was like a father to him. He took no pleasure personally in defeating Bear Bryant. It meant the world to him for the Auburn family. But knowing that the end was near for, for Coach Bryant, it really, really hurt Pat Dye. And that was and, and that was something I really wasn't aware of until uh, I, I had that conversation with this gentleman, again, who was on the staff at Auburn, walked to midfield after that historic game. So that game, obviously, is huge in this state's football history. And then, of course, the first Iron Bowl in Auburn. The fact that, again, this was, this was all part of the process of Pat Dye bringing Auburn up to a level where it could look Alabama in the eye. And where that really happened, and this was this was an incredible show of support for Pat Dye. After the 1984 Iron Bowl, that was the Bo went the wrong way game. Uh, the, he, he was a decoy. He was supposed to block for Brent Fullwood. He went the wrong way. Brent Fullwood uh, got tackled by an Alabama defensive back named Rory Turner, one of the great quotes uh, in, in football history, who said, I waxed the dude as he drove him out of bounds. Uh, Pat Dye broke out in hives after that game. He knew he'd let one a, a huge game get, get away. Alabama had a losing record that season under Ray Perkins. Uh, Auburn would have gone to the Sugar Bowl for the second straight year had they won the game. But not long after that, the Auburn Board of Trustees voted to expand Jordan-Hare Stadium to almost the capacity it has today. And that vote of confidence, their belief in Pat Dye was a – Huge factor in Auburn being able to get that game to Auburn, to the Plains, to Jordan-Hare Stadium. And then they really forced Alabama to keep up to improve Bryant-Denny. And, and Alabama knew that it was going to have to move its home game eventually to campus once Auburn did it. So he changed the game fundamentally, made it a rivalry, and, and made it, to me, as, as fun as it was at Legion Field. And you'll hear old-timers with the, you know, talk nostalgically about, mm -hmm. well, it was great when the feet, you know, the crowd was split 50, 50 and there was cheering after every play. It really wasn't quite 50, 50 <laughs> Legion field was Alabama's home game, home stadium for all of its big games back in the day. Uh, they certainly played in Tuscaloosa as well, but their biggest games were played in Birmingham. So it was, it was, it was not, it was a home field for Alabama more than it was for Auburn, even though the crowd was mostly split. <laughs> Let, let's say it that way. So for, for Pat and I to change that fundamentally, and you can remember Bear Bryant said that would never happen. Ray Perkins, who was the coach at Alabama in the mid eighties said, I, he would never take a team to, uh, to Jordan Hare stadium to Auburn. And of course he didn't, he left to go to Tampa Bay in the NFL before it happened. So no, Pat, Pat I was, was the figure most responsible for making those things happen in college football in this state today. And Auburn today is better for it. Ray Perkins has actually given some some great comments today about Pat Dye and the respect that he had for him and their relationship together. Gene Stallings has as well, and obviously we know that, as you said, he had a, a very strong relationship with Bear Bryant. We've posted some photos, I think, on our Facebook page of the two of them, these sort of classic photos of the two of them uh, off hunting together in the woods. It's just kind of a it's, – it's a little bit difficult to, to imagine the relationship between an Alabama and an Auburn coach being like that. Uh, today with things being so sort of contentious as they've gotten over the years. But it was it was it was really a different uh, era for the sport and for the coaches. Uh, I, I want to ask you a little bit, Kevin, about the influence that Pat Dye had beyond his coaching career at Auburn, because, uh, you know, he obviously was a tremendously successful coach on the field, took Auburn to to levels it had really not been to before as a program and really. I think in part because of that success, he remained a very influential figure at Auburn uh, well beyond his coaching career. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how how crucial he was to the program and how much his opinion mattered there uh, in the in the decades after his coaching career ended? 
Uh, there's no question about that, Matt. And, and he didn't mind sharing his opinion <laughs> behind the <laughs> scenes in particular, sometimes publicly. He wasn't shy about about talking about things. I still remember uh, him being there at Gene Chizik's introductory press conference. You know, Pat and Tommy Tuberville had, well, let's see, how should we put it, a checkered relationship. Uh, they weren't necessarily always on the same page throughout Tommy's tenure. Uh, but Pat was really on board with uh, with Gene Chizik's hire. And now he he had, he he said, I'll never forget him saying, well, you know, I, I didn't really have anything to do with it. It wasn't real. He was he was very instrumental in uh, he was in Jay Jacobs here and Jay Jacobs, the athletic director at the time, was in his ear about that hire. Uh, he very much endorsed that because I think he saw in Gene Chizik uh, some characteristics of a young pad die. Uh, and obviously, Gene did some spectacularly good things and then flamed out spectacularly as well. Uh, but Pat's Pat's opinion was respected and sought out. And some people thought he had too much of a hand in in decisions that were made. Again, Jay Jacobs was his guy. Jay Jacobs, the longtime athletic director, played for Pat Dye. He was the quintessential Pat Dye player. He was a walk on and earned playing time. Wasn't the most talented. Uh, wasn't a superstar, but worked his tail off, earned a spot on the team. And, and, and those were really Pat Dye's kind of guys. So Pat had enormous influence on Jay Jacobs going forward. But, you know, all the success that, that Auburn's had in, in the intervening decades, if you look at it, I don't think people appreciate, Matt. You know how many SEC championships Auburn won before Pat Dye became the head coach in football? One. One in 1957. You know how many they've won since? Seven. You know who won four of those? <laughs> Pat Dye. <laughs> Pat Dye. So hey, there's only two since Pat Dye. Here, here's I, I love fun facts. Uh, here's a couple of more fun facts for you. You know how many coaches in the SEC since 1981, when Pat Dye started at Auburn as a head coach, you know how many SEC coaches have won more SEC championships than Pat Dye? Two. Nick Saban and Steve Spurrier. That's that's the the level he belongs at. I don't think he's been given credit necessarily, uh, certainly outside the state, maybe even just outside the Auburn family, of of what he accomplished on the field. You know, winning four straight Iron Bowls, or winning three straight SEC championships. He really should have won six straight Iron Bowls because they let that '84 game get away oh. when Bo went the wrong way, and then they let the then the '85 game. Uh, which was the first one I covered as a as a, a beat writer for the Birmingham News, maybe the best game ever, certainly in, on the short list when Van Tiffin kicked the field goal to win it at the end for Alabama. Uh, you know, the, you could argue Auburn could have, should have, would have won those two. They could have won six in a row. Uh, it didn't end well, obviously. Uh, he lost his last three after Gene Stallings came in and things started to go wrong at Auburn internally. But, you know, his influence was well earned because – Auburn, and it's hard to imagine this, they were they were one of the original six. There were six haves and six have-nots, if right. you will, in the SEC. Uh, Auburn was on was on the lower end of the haves. But that 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 stat says it all to me. One SEC championship that Auburn had won before Pat Dye got there. Seven since he won four of them. Well, Kevin, you mentioned that you, you know, your early part of your career with us, you you had the the chance to cover. Pat Dye, you, you were at press conferences with him. You, you talked to him, you know, in an official capacity and probably an unofficial capacity too, in a lot of different situations. Is there a, is there a story? There's obviously a lot of colorful stories out there about <laughs> Pat Dye, but I'm yes. curious if you've got one that, that sticks out to you that you remember about your experiences with him. Well, ju just how accessible he was, Matt. And I can give you uh, really a couple of examples. First of all, you could watch practice back in those days. I mean the whole practice, and I did. When I was the beat writer for four years from 85 through 88, those four football seasons, starting with Bo Jackson's senior year, uh, I, I watched every practice that was open. Now, Pat would close practice occasionally on big game weeks. We used to go back and forth about that. I would say, Pat, you know, you try to send this message to your players, all games matter, all games are as important as the other, but if you close practice for the Georgia game and the Alabama game, you're sending a message to your players <laughs> This game's more important than those other ones. Uh, and we'd go back and forth on it. But he was so accessible. You could talk to him after pra every single practice. Now, 
He wouldn't always stop to talk to you. You could tell what kind of practice they'd had in his eyes by whether he stopped to talk. That was a good thing. If he kept walking and you had to run alongside him to the coach's locker room in the old Beardies Memorial Coliseum, they hadn't had a good practice. Uh, I can distinctly remember times just walking with him once. I can remember once walk. I, I what he hadn't finished answering my question as he opened the door to the coach's locker room <laughs> in Beardies. I w- I walked right in next to him, and here are you talk about a group of hard nosed Southern football coaches: Larry Blakeney, Wayne Hall, uh, Aunt Joe Witt. You go on and on. That was Pat Dye's staff, and and, and they they looked at me like like I like I was an alien. What are you from another planet? What are you doing in here? You don't belong in here, but Pat was still talking. He didn't mind. And and here's what maybe my favorite personal memory. Pat, well, two more. One, every time I called his house, and, and there were occasions, that, uh, and I tried to only do it on important issues, important stories, uh, he returned my call. If he didn't answer the phone, if he wasn't at home, his wife would take, his wife at the time would take the message and he would call me back every single time. And I was I was a beat writer, but I was a lowly, lowly beat writer, you know, and 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 especially Pat and I, you know, Pat and I couldn't have been more different. I mean, here I'm a young punk who grew up in Pennsylvania and I'm the Auburn beat writer all of a sudden at the age of 23. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm so new to this business. But Pat kind of he worked with me. He allowed me to develop a relationship. And every Wednesday, Matt, again, this will blow current beat writers minds <laughs> and maybe current fans minds. Every Wednesday during football season, I would sit down with Pat Dye in his office for might be 20 minutes, might be 40 minutes. We could talk about anything. A lot of it was off the record, but it allowed you to understand his thinking on certain decisions he'd made or, or what he was planning. We discussed rumors. Uh, there was a there was an ugly rumor about him at one point that was untrue. And, and I had to ask him about it. And he actually brought it up himself made it easier for me to talk to him about it. Uh, the fact that he took the time to do that, um, again, there was a personal side to him. He was as tough as nails, but there was a, there was a personal side to Pat Dye, a tenderhearted side that his players saw. He was, he was one of those coaches, and I see this in Nick Saban, as tough as he is and can be, and as, as hard as people think he is, he is truly a player's coach. And that is the, that was exactly what Pat Dye was. He was a player's coach. He would go to the ends of the earth for those players. He believed in them. That's why they believed in him, and that's why they played so hard for him. Well, a unique and an unforgettable figure uh, in all of college football in the state of Alabama. Uh, our thoughts are with the Auburn community today, with the Dye family. And, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us to share some of your memories and thoughts about Coach Dye. Matt, I appreciate it. Yeah, we lost we lost a giant today. There's no doubt. Well, thanks for joining us. And we've got plenty more coverage uh, over at AL.com and lots of stories and memories about Pat Dye.